and still heavier elements begin to form. Sulfur, argon, chlorine, potassium, calcium, scandium. And the pace of this gets faster and faster. Back in the middle, silicon is starting to burn at three and a half billion degrees. Stupendous temperature. It makes titanium, vanadium, chromium. Manganese, cobalt, nickel, and iron. Iron is really the end of the road. It's, it's sort of the nuclear turnip out of which you just cannot squeeze uh, anymore. It's the end of the game. A star that has relied on fusion has come to the point where it has nothing more to spin. The star is suddenly caught in a disaster. There's radiation going out from the outside, but deep in the inside, there's uh, no more fuel. Iron can't fuel this stellar furnace. And so, when a star builds up too much iron, it dies. The core collapses, it bounces. And it begins to move out, first slowly and then faster and faster. And that sends a very sharp wave back out through the star. And now what was falling down is going out, the whole thing's blowing up. And you've made a supernova. The supernova explosion can be as bright as four billion stars like the sun. A stupendous explosion. Such outrageous energies overcome the iron barrier cooking atoms into all the rest of the elements on the periodic table. So starting down here, you can go copper, zinc, gallium, germanium, arsenic, zirconium, zirconium niobium, molybdenum, technetium, rhodium, ytterbium, thorium, iodine, radon, xenon, cesium, barium, lanthanum, cerium, indium, thorium, protactinium, uranium. Done. <laughs> That's enough elements. <laughs> we are all stardust carbon in our bodies, the iron in our blood, the calcium in our bones. Every last atom was formed in a star. But it's not that simple. No one star can produce more than just a dusting of heavy elements. So, to create an environment friendly to life, the universe had to find a way to concentrate the good stuff. Which it did in a process that is remarkably like the way Chef Michael Romano cooks up a bowl of soup. As you know, a cornerstone of great cooking is a rich soup. And all soup starts with water. So let's add some water in the pot. Mm -hmm. In this culinary cosmos, these ingredients stand in for the first stars, each flavoring the surrounding broth just a little bit. And then we need heat, which we have. There's no shortage of heat in the cosmos, it turns out. <laughs> That's a good thing. In the broth left behind by the first stars, new stars form. That's this second round of ingredients. And as they simmer, the interstellar soup gets stronger and stronger. Look at how rich that's become. I, I, I still can't wait. Yeah, you remember that water that we started with? Right. And look what it's turned into. It's actually thickened and a lot of flavor in there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think at this point it has enough flavor to support adding the star of the show, which is our shellfish and fish. Finally, this cosmic soup is nearly ready. To the point where, after bubbling for billions of years, it can support the kind of life that would emerge on Earth. And there you go, Neil. That's for you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Enjoy it. Thank you. What Michael just did is entirely analogous to what happens in the real universe, where each generation of stars enriches the broth out of which the next generation forms, until, at last, the cosmic soup is rich enough for life. We know this occurs because we can see it happening next door, right in our own Milky Way galaxy. In perhaps the most famous astronomical image ever made, the Hubble Space Telescope portrait of the Eagle Nebula. It does feel like this image is everywhere because this image is everywhere. It's not everybody who gets to see something that they've done show up on a postage stamp or happen to see something that you've done on a t-shirt with somebody just walking across campus. My wife will see this picture in some context and she'll poke me and say, now explain to me again why we don't get any royalties off that picture. <laughs> That picture of the Eagle Nebula has been dubbed the Pillars of Creation. It's become a modern icon 
When the Hubble first transmitted it back to Earth, scientists themselves were stunned at what they saw. We were not prepared for what we saw when we finally got the images of the Eagle Nebula put together. We weren't prepared for the beauty of what we had assembled. We weren't really prepared for the science of what emerged from it. Um, it every now and then you get lucky. What the image revealed were places in our own Milky Way galaxy where new stars are actually forming. You see these little nodules sitting around here. Each one of those is large enough to swallow our solar system several times over. Embedded in at least some of those, we can see that there are young stars, stars that will become stars like our sun around which are going to form solar systems, perhaps like our own. Is it possible that four and a half billion years from now, some civilization on a planet orbiting that star will look up at the sky and wonder about where they came from? I'm not gonna say it's likely, but it is certainly possible. Possible because conditions in the Eagle Nebula are close to what they are here the one place in the universe we know that life exists, our own solar system. The Eagle Nebula contains just about the same mix of heavy elements that our sun does, carbon, nitrogen, and the rest. But the big question is whether life, or at least the conditions that could allow life to emerge, are widespread throughout the cosmos. Do we live in a universe that welcomes life? Or are the hundred billion galaxies out there mostly barren, empty desert? That's the question that brings Sandra Faber to the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. What are the odds for life in the cosmos as a whole? It's important to realize that astronomically, the seeds of life on Earth were sown four and a half billion years ago when the sun and solar system formed. That's a long time back in the past. But we can ask ourselves now, can we see the seeds of life in other galaxies in great abundance back then, or maybe even perhaps earlier than that? Sandy uses the Keck telescope as a kind of time machine that can look deep into the past. Its giant mirror, 36 feet across, can capture a snapshot of galaxies when they were much younger than our own. But merely seeing such distant galaxies is not enough. Sandy wants to discover what they're made of. To find out, she uses an instrument called a spectrograph. Sandy's spectrograph, called DEMOS, is one of the most powerful in the world. It takes the light from up to 150 galaxies at a time, each isolated in a single hole in a sheet of metal called a slit mask. DEMOS then breaks that light up into the visible spectrum, the rainbow of colors from violet to red. Zooming in on a galactic spectrum reveals a forest of bright and dark